in the stream. All right. Have a good show. Thanks. Excellent. Happy trails, Tony Cook. This is your farewell tune. Happy trails, Tony Cook. Please come back real soon. Happy trails, Tony Cook. We'll all look at the moon. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Oh, right, we can't see through that kind of weather. Happy trails, Tony Cove. We'll all look at the moon. Happy trails, Tony Cook. You're like a shooting star. Happy trails, Tony Cook. We'll miss you at the park. Happy trails, Tony Cook. A new master to all. You taught me star names, man, you really rock. Ha! Like I'll me talk, I'll be lament me talk. Happy trails, Tony Cook. We'll all look at the moon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and I'm happy to bring you to our, what month is it? Our February edition of All Space Considered. And that was our media information there, our, our social media information. Please sign up and follow. It is Friday, February 5th, 2021. And oh, I'm going to back up. I don't want to go through our, our stories quite yet because I want to introduce our panel, first of all, of course. Um, you know, with us tonight is Patrick So, as always, and Anthony Cook is with us as well, which is fantastic. Hi, Tony. And a brand new, well, not so brand new, actually, I should say returning member to All Space Considered, Chris Butler. Um, you were there for one of our earliest All Space Considered, so it was 12 and a half, 13 years ago, whatever it was, but we welcome him back. And as you can see behind him, there is a Saturn V that's a tip off of what Chris might be bringing us tonight. Um, but again, um, we are thrilled to be back. Uh, we did take January off. I think the first Friday was the first of January. So that was a holiday for all of us city employees. Of course, in December, we said goodbye to Laura and congratulated her. And tonight we are here to honor Tony Cook and uh, celebrate all his contributions and the wonderful work he's done with us at All Space Considered and Griffith Observatory as well. 
So as you know, All Space Considered does occur every first Friday on, uh, of the month, and we are happy to do so. We're continuing along, along that tradition, and we bring you all sorts of space news. But I want to stop and thank the city of LA that uh, makes Griffith Observatory possible for the public. And I also want to thank Friends of the Observatory, our support group. And there is a link in the YouTube information just below the video for you to sign up and join Friends of the Observatory. And I heartily encourage you to do so. We'll give some reasons for you to do so in a little bit later in the show. But the biggest reason of all is they make so much of what we do possible. They get us equipment, they get us connections, they help us do Oh gosh, pretty much everything we do has a connection to Friends of the Observatory. So if you like what we do, you should become a member and get some benefits out of that in addition to knowing that you provide some support to us and what we do. So tonight, I'm happy to bring to you the story. So the Super Bowl of Astronomy, and I do quote, um, and that's the Golden Griffey nomination night. So we, you know, we double these things up. We go straight from sports season to award season. Um, SS, SN9, what the heck is that all about? I think it's a starship and maybe the ninth one. Juno and InSight missions were extended, but the mall is no more. And remembering Apollo 14. Okay, that, that'll be interesting. Like I said, Chris is here to talk about that, the 50th anniversary. We'll have a sky report from Patrick and we will remember Chuck Yeager and Tom LeBonge. He was our formal council member. And then we'll have our pretty picture section as always. Um, we'll also then in our second half, so to speak, we won't take a real break other than our little pretty picture section. We will celebrate Tony Cook as this is your life, uh, Tony. And I'm not sure any of us that put this together really ever saw that program. So forgive us now for the lack of a theme, but we, we like what we did very much and we're, we're thrilled <laughs> to, to celebrate you tonight. So let's get right to it. Right off the bat, um, I'm happy to talk about our Super Bowl of Astronomy, as you can see. Uh, there's our, our very own Tony Cook Zebra Centaur. Um, and it, we, we've set up a five-way battle between five different teams, the Dark Matter and Gravity team, the Galaxy and Quasars team, the Modern Milky Way, stars and nebulae, and lastly, exoplanets and brown dwarfs, which you know, I gotta love the Galileo replica telescope we added there. Um, so we divided up all the big announcements from the AAS meeting into those teams, and we're going to award points based on the discoveries. And then we'll tally up all those points, get to a subtotal, and then we'll open it up to you to vote in our fan favorite poll. And then next month, we'll tally up all the points and we'll award the Golden Griffies. Are you confused? Well. Here's Bill to tell you all about it. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, science lovers around the globe, the 237th meeting of the American Astronomical Society has completed. And have we got some space news for you. This meeting is called by some, and I quote, the Super Bowl of Astronomy. We've got globular clusters, exoplanets, quasars, magnetars. We've even got a triple galaxy collision, wow. This Friday, February 5th at All Space Considered, we'll tally up the points for each scientific touchdown, home run, three-pointer, hole-in-one, strike, spare, or wicket, and set the stage for you to vote and pick the final fan favorites. It's astronomical playoff season where you pick the winners. Excited? Confused? We're not surprised. We'll mix every metaphor we can find. After all, why would we want to stick to just one metaphor? So this month, root for your team in the AAS Super Bowl hear the latest Griffey buzz, and then in March, join us on the virtual red carpet to see the stars, the real stars, in the annual All Space Considered Golden Griffies. We kick it all off this Friday on February 5th, live at All Space Considered. Thank you. That's right, that's now we're kicking it all off live. So we have our scoreboard in place, as you can see here, Griffith Observatory, the American Astronomical Society Super Bowl, and we welcome you to Griffith Park. Um, first of all, we've got zeros across the board. So let's take a look at some of our, our scores. So first, news from the dark side, dark matter and gravity team is up on our first day in the first inning. Um, globular clusters, which are large clusters of stars, hundreds of thousands to millions of them at a time can be used to trace the dark matter in galaxies. And it turns out some of the most dwarf-like don't have very much dark matter. They scored three points for that result. Another result here, you can go in and use pulsars to measure the Milky Way's gravitational field. An incredible three-point result. We gave them a field goal for that one as well. Um, next one, you can use all right, around the Earth, you can search for the gravitational wave background 
We've all heard about colliding black holes, colliding pulsars, making gravitational waves. Well, there's just a background constant hum due to the ones that are sort of close, really long wavelength radiation. We gave them six points for this because they actually picked up a signal. They don't know what the signal is, but they picked one up. So they got a touchdown without the extra point. Moving along, um, this confusing result, this was the best I could show for you. There was not an easy picture. Seemed somewhat important because the, the galactic center has emission coming out of there that we don't fully understand what it is. And they went in and made models of it, but only one point because it, didn't, it wasn't easily explainable to the public and yet it was a press release. So if you really love this one, maybe you'll give it some fan favorite points. So tallying up the points for the dark matter team, gravity team, 13 points in our first inning. Moving along into our next inning, there was a triple star system found in the Kepler survey. So a very interesting survey, it was a confirmation of the second planet Kepler ever saw, it's in a triple star, star system. So they got three points for confirming that exoplanet finally. Another exoplanet result, it's the first result of a giant planet transiting in the outer part of a solar system. So now it's 200 and some days it takes to orbit. I forget the exact number, but since it's the first big one they found that isn't super close to its star, we gave them three points for that. A two point result for a rocky planet around a 10 billion year old star. So a very, very old rocky planet. We gave them two points, that's a safety. Maybe it's a two point basket though. I don't know which, we need to think about this because this one's a three pointer. There was a sub Neptune that can be turned into a super earth. The idea of this is sub Neptunes are planets that are like Neptune, but smaller sub Neptune, go figure. If, they la if they're cl close to their star, that intense radiation over billions of years can blow away that atmosphere, leaving behind a super Earth. Now, is it going to look like Earth like they did in this picture? Probably not, but nonetheless, they got a three-point bucket for that one. Tallying up the points for our exoplanet and brown dwarf team down at the bottom, the very bottom row, they got 11 points total in the second inning. Moving on to our third inning, one point for the gravi for the Galaxy and Quasar team where they saw a periodic nuclear transit. So there's a periodic transit going on, um, a signal that comes and goes, but it's, it's periodic that they can see coming from the AGN down near the center of the black hole there. They got one point for that result because there are a lot of AGN. Um, this result was seen by a team of, uh, of uh, citizen scientists, in fact, young ones, that saw the brightest galaxy in the red, Redshift 5 range. And it's this arc you're seeing that looks like sort of a one-eyed smiley face. And they got a, a two-point bucket for that one. Now, this is a X-ray source that doesn't give off much optical light at all. It's a heavily observed, uh, excuse me, a heavily obscured quasar. And we gave them a two-point score for that one. Lastly, the most distant quasar in the universe. Now this quasar is when the universe was only 600 and some odd million years old. So very, very early, the black hole is so big that makes this literally millions of solar masses that how do you, how do you make them that big this early on? It, it actually confounds formation models a little bit. So we gave them five points for this. That's like an ace in tennis. So they get a five, five love going on out of that one. So mixing our, our metaphors here, we'll continue tallying up all the points for galaxies and quasars. They got a massive 10 points. So you might wonder about that 10 versus 13, 11. Don't worry, that was only the first galaxy session. They've got more points coming their way. Moving along into our next inning, we have an interesting story about symbiotic stars in the Apogee survey. So this is a white dwarf that's pulling material off of a, off of a red dwarf for two points. We have another interesting story about a new new members in a stellar stream around the Milky Way. There are lots of streams. There are dwarf galaxies being torn apart by the gravity of the Milky Way. Well, this is a new stream that they're finding more stars for it. So they get a three point bucket. We awarded a, a two point basket for these folks that used the Galaxy Zoo 3D platform or citizen science crowdsourcing features in galaxies. And you can see in this galaxy, they identified the bar across the center of it. They identified some stars and they're, in, they're able to go in and automate a lot of the, the way you can determine what these shapes are, and what these galaxies look like by having citizens go in and do it. So a two point bucket for everybody's efforts on that. Now, lastly, 2020, what a year. We are on sky and taking data. What the heck are we talking about there? Well. It's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4 opening up to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 5. It's one of the longest running sky surveys. 
covers the whole sky and they made a couple of discoveries that they just show you on this. There's more discoveries than two, obviously, but I gave them one point for the quasars and galaxy team and one point for the white dwarf team and moved on from there, the stars team, because there's so many discoveries in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Like they like to say it's the energizer bunny of sky surveys. It just keeps on going. It's been going forever. We tally up all those points. And as you can see, we awarded three to galaxies and quasars, three to the modern Milky Way and three two stars and nebulae in that inning. So splitting the points up in inning four, getting a little more exciting here in our Super Bowl of, of astronomy. Who's gonna move on to the playoff round? That's the big question. Now, bursting magnetars, they were super clever. They decided to talk about this magnetar that's masquerading in the sculptor galaxy. So they broke their discovery into several different press releases. And the first one just said, hey, we found this thing. One point for the find. One point for saying, is it a gamma ray bursting or is it a giant flare? We don't know which, but we're working on it, trying to figure it out. And they figured out it's actually a giant flare. So they get a point for proposing it and three points for saying it's a giant flare going on, a magnetar flaring. Now what's neat about this is this flaring magnetar looks just like gamma ray bursts. So they think these mysterious gamma ray bursts that we say, these high energy, in fact, it's making my camera shake with so much energy coming from distant universe galaxies. So much energy comes from these, we can see them very, very far away. And they believe that one of the sources for these could be bursting magnetars. So we give them five points, another tennis score for coming up with that theory of what these gamma ray bursts are. And fast radio bursts, um, actually, no, I, I take all that back. I've been misspeaking. It's not the gamma ray bursts, it's the fast radio bursts uh, that are explained by it. And of course, we've talked about fast radio bursts in the past. Much lower energy events, but they come from very, very far away. I realized I was just misspeaking, saying gamma ray bursts instead of fast radio bursts. So we've talked about those before. They've been mysterious for a long time. We give them five points for determining the source of those fast radio bursts is indeed these magnetar stars that are bursting. And then they wrote up a one point um, kind of a, a closing statement where they claimed they've solved the mystery of what these fast radio bursts were. So a total number of points there we award of eight points to stars and nebulae and three points to galaxies and quasars because that's how the points get divided up here because it's uh, magnetars bursting and kind of fit both realms. They're stars, but they're also in distant galaxies. So that's where we gave our points. Moving along into the realm of galaxies and quasars, the second session. Three's a crowd, um, a triple galaxy collision. Oh, I think I moved along too far. We're in the DESI section. Sorry, the dark energy survey. That's the image I'm seeing here. I was wondering where did the th three galaxies go? You see this galaxy or dark energy survey has a platform you can go in and they show you all the sources they've observed. They've released their data. So we gave them three points for the data release. We gave three points for them discovering extremely cold brown dwarfs. Then we gave them, oh no, this is the strong gravitational lens, of course. I have to look at the actual slide of what's up there, of course. You're seeing gravitational lensing arcs around these blue sources. Here are our brown dwarfs around, the, around our Earth, five points for that discovery, nearby brown dwarfs. And then finally, black holes are everywhere. Now you might guess, again, dark energy survey, we awarded the points spread across our different contestants again. We gave nine points to the galaxies and quasars, and we gave five for those brown dwarfs to the exoplanet and brown dwarf team. So looking at our scores now as we're moving on, we're more than halfway done here with inning six finished. Into the seventh inning, we've got our leader, the galaxies and quasars with an astounding lead of 25 points. The next nearest is our exoplanet and brown dwarfs at 16. Moving right along into our exciting seventh inning. Here's where we finally have, uh-oh. Okay, well, I no longer have control over the PowerPoint as my team viewer sessions expired. So if, if Chris, could you take that over for a second and then I'll load it once I go there. So I'll just tell you to forward the slide. Um, so we can see our triple galaxies there that have merged. Three's a crowd, galaxy collisions, three of them colliding. What does that mean? And what does it mean for black hole accretion? We went ahead and awarded some points for that and I can't quite see what they are, but hey, it'll all make sense when we get there. Moving on to the next slide, if you can advance it for me. Perfect. We have a galaxy here. These are the deep images of mergers. And actually you're seeing there, it flashed back and forth. And that's signs that this galaxy, Centaurus A, has merged with many galaxies over time. And we can move ahead to the next one. And we can take a look here. The, um, the magnetic highway. 
looking at the magnetic fields of M82 and its super wind. So a pretty cool image there. And finally, the magnetic chaos hidden in the Whirlpool galaxy. If we take a look at our next one, you can see the Whirlpool galaxy, famous, famous galaxy, popular among a lot of people because it's so pretty. They've mapped the magnetic field in this galaxy. So let's take a look at what points we gave to these galaxies as we move to our next slide. And we see here, it looks like they've wrapped up, racked up another 11 points for galaxies and quasars for a whopping 36 points. Let's move ahead and see if we can find any more points for any other teams. Well, we have the rise and fall of a remarkable eclipsing binary star. I don't see any binaries there, but we did give them some points. Let's move ahead. The final projected sample for um, do, do hundreds of thousands of eclipsing binaries should be seen through machine learning. They're predicting when they go into the test sample, they're going to be able to find these through the machines learning what to look for. Finally, moving to the next one, unbinding the stellar envelope in a grazing envelope evolution. What does that even mean? Well, two stars are close to one another. They affect one another and material can be flung out, material can be transferred, and you can get jets. Super cool stuff. Let's move along to the next one. And we can see here, we are doo -doo -doo, finally exploring the supernova, supernova remnant connection. So x-rays in this supernova remnant, very cool. And finally, lastly, in this section, the center of expansion and an age of oxygen rich supernova remnant. So this was the evolving stars in supernova section. Let's take a look how the scores fell out with these exciting ones. You all have seen the, the scores I've awarded, but they're too small for me. So what do we have here? It looks like we gave nine points for stars and nebulae over that section. So they've gone up to 20, getting closer to those galaxies and quasars. Let's move along to our, our final day, our Friday. And we see here, we have extreme contrast ratio imaging of Sirius. Believe it or not, one of the brightest stars in the sky is dead center in that image. And they've been able to remove it and see the faint stars around it. They can see Sirius B, very cool technique. Let's move along to the next one. This is the galactic warp of the Milky Way. They were able to go in and by flipping this image side to side, you can see how the disk of the Milky Way is actually warped. So a pretty neat technique to get some points for that team. Let's move ahead to the next image. Here we're investigating a new stellar association in the galactic disk called Theia 456. What does it mean? Is it real? Well, vote some points. Maybe you can hear more about it next month if you, if you vote for them in the fan favorite. So let's take a look at our last modern Milky Way section. All stories about our Milky Way. Here's one about the defensive halo blocking an incoming gas cloud. This is a story that, uh, of course, Lord Danley would have been very fond of, gas being added under our galaxy. So what's this story all about? I do wonder. So let's move ahead and see what points we scored for our modern Milky Way. It looks like we awarded 15 points. So the modern Milky Way finally gets 18 points to their score. Let's take a look at our very last 10th inning here, our last session that was on Friday of the Astronomical Super Bowl. Our first story, scientists explain a jet pointing the wrong way. Now jets do come out of AGN, out of these black holes as material falls in. Some of it gets accelerated and shot out, usually perpendicular to a disk. This one was pointing the wrong way. Well, why? maybe vote them some fan points and you might hear about it next month. Let's move on to the next one. This is the Butterfly Nebula. They went in, gorgeous image. They did some analysis of what was there, what chemicals were there and how it formed. Just gorgeous. So we awarded a, a seven points. I remember that one. And finally, we end up our whole double S of astronomy, the Super Bowl, with the Jewel Bug Nebula, another planetary nebula as these stars shed off their outer layers as a, as a large star dies, a star like the sun makes these beautiful things called planetary nebulae. Well, they went in and investigated where the chemicals were, how the outflows happen. Very nice work. So we awarded another seven points. So let's go to our scoreboard finally, and we'll take a look at our final scores for our Super Bowl of astronomy. If we want to go ahead and forward. Dave, I believe I have timed out just like you did. I lost my controls. Yeah, but it looks like we're all losing control. Matthew will have to take over. We'll have to log back in. This is new that they've added on everybody. It worked fine just last, last time we tested it. We did not have any timeout issues. So a new twist they've put in. In fact, it says to me, 2021, it just got better, the software we're using. <laughs> so maybe we won't use it because they think this is better. 
Anyhow, uh, moving right along, we can see our final scores for our Super Bowl astronomy, our subtotals. We have in the lead, galaxies and quasars with 37 points, 34 stars and nebulae, just barely behind that last inning was very exciting. And they scored a few more points, they might've pulled ahead. Then way kind of far behind, we've got the modern Milky Way at 18. And at 16, we've got the exoplanets and brown dwarfs and way, way back there, dark matter and gravity with only 13 points. Now. You don't like that? You don't want to have galaxies and quasars win the Golden Griffies? Well, you can change it. You can vote. So if we can get to the next slide, we can forward it. We'll go forward one slide. We can take a look and see how you can vote. You can go online. That link right there, it should be in our description of our video. We'll also tweet it later after the show. You can go there, fill out the form, and vote for your favorite. One vote, one point. If enough people vote for one of these teams that are behind, you can pull them into the lead. And we'll award them the Golden Griffey and we'll tell you more about those stories. We'll tell some of them in detail and you'll understand more about what I was just babbling on about for a while. So let's step forward one more slide. Let's see what we're at here, if I remember right. That's right, we are on to our Starship 9 section, which is a lot of fun. Um, SpaceX, of course, has been building Starship. It's an extremely large rocket that they, they wanna have it go up, come back down land, have it be reusable. Now keep in mind, this is just the top part. The bottom part is actually larger. This is the part that'll go off into space, fly off to Mars, land on Mars, refuel, fly, take off from Mars, maybe refuel again, and then head back to Earth and land. It, it's stunning technology if they can make it work. Um, they're in the testing phases. So keep in mind, tests that go wrong are sometimes better than ones that go right because you're revealing problems and you can fix them. So let's see, did they find any problems with the flight? Let's go ahead and roll the video. There's the There's big ignition. Photo. And lift, lift off. off. Oh, I lifted off. Locks tank, we're beginning to flip to horizontal. And the white cloud, the plume you were seeing was intentional. There is a liquid oxygen dump. We've now transitioned to horizontal. Amazing. Look at the ice. Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. And the flip looks like they lost a the piece oh. there. Oh. Well, yeah, that's that was disappointing. I don't know. Pull up, pull up. Elon says next time we'll do the pull up maneuver and it won't crash. Um, but anyway, like I said, this is why you test. This is why you do it. You find these mistakes and it's hard. Going to space is hard. Launching these is hard and landing them is even harder. So it's stunning what they're they're getting done as quickly as they are. The FAA wasn't so happy about this. I know they delayed it a few days. I'm, I don't know if I ever got to the bottom of that, but I very much hope that they continue to work with SpaceX to let them move rapidly. Watching them evolve these rapidly, make corrections, test again, it's the way you get things done and the way we're gonna see the future happen sooner. I understand why NASA has to be careful. Makes sense, it's federal money. We all don't wanna have waste, but if SpaceX is willing to blow up rockets, I say, let's let them if they make more progress that way. You know, it's a good way to go. Yeah, but if, I, if I could just say something. Yeah. yeah um, two things, the one thought I had with this is if you remember how many times Falcon 9's exploded trying to land and how they've turned that into a re reliable system, which now is having a reverberation through the whole rocket industry, you know? Now reusability is formed. So this is a this is a spaceship that's aiming higher than Falcon 9. It's harder yeah, it, to do, but I think you know they're doing the right thing right now. Yeah, yeah. very much so. I, I couldn't agree more, Tony. Um, yeah, and I do, I want to make the point for here from the uh, the the past where I'm residing. Uh, a lot of us today forget a lot of our early rockets also exploded. Testing phase always involves this. This is nothing unusual. SpaceX isn't doing anything wrong. They're doing exactly what they need to do to learn and get it right. Yeah, and as far as the FAA, after the FAA tweeted uh, right after this flight, or actually just before it, but um, the problem they had was with, it, was with SN8 because apparently there was some violation that uh, SpaceX hadn't cleared up for that flight. But that they were very satisfied with what they did with SN9 and that they expected there would be no more problems with SpaceX going ahead with their plans. So. 
Yeah, the, absolutely. The I, I, had, I had wondered if what they weren't happy about is the fact they went up to 12 and a half kilometers because the next one they were only allowed to go to 10. So makes you wonder if they had said, let's go to, we want to go to 12 and a half. And the FAA said, no, 10. And they said, we're going to 12 and a half. <laughs> Who knows? You, you know, it, it pushing boundaries is what SpaceX does, but I'm glad they worked it out. And like I said, I very much hope we move forward. Well, I'm back on with our control the PowerPoint remotely, because of course we're doing this whole show remotely. We're not in the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater as much as we very much would like to be. And as soon as we can do it safely, we will move on with that. So Patrick, on to you with another Juno report. We've had this spacecraft going around Jupiter getting close to it, flying away, giving these, these brilliant images. But um, I know we're getting down near the end of this mission. So let's hear about what's going on with Juno. Yeah, there's some uh, really good news uh, with the uh, Juno mission um, to uh, Jupiter. And uh, the um, I'm going to just go, uh, let's go to the next slide here, because I'm going to show you the orbits here. Uh, this is the uh, all the orbits uh, shown in blue uh, that uh, Juno um, uh, has as it goes around Jupiter. It goes from 4 million miles from Jupiter to a very close point uh, called a perijove, um, where it's only a mere uh, 2,600 miles above the cloud tops of Jupiter. The green line there is the actual end of the mission. That's the last orbit of, uh, of Juno. Uh, and at that time, it would be uh, sent into the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter and it would just be destroyed. Um, since uh, 2016, uh, there have been 31 perigeos, um, so 31 orbits, and there's only a few more to go. And at these perigeos, uh, we have seen some really uh, fantastic, super high resolution uh, images of uh, Jupiter's uh, cloud tops, including the red spot. We can go and take a look at the next one here. These details are uh, some of the best pictures we've ever seen from the Juno cam. Um, on, on the spacecraft. Now we're gonna to go to the next slide here because uh, we'll take a look at a detailed um, look at the mission in this. Yeah, whoa, are, are we gonna go through this in detail and explain? Yeah, we're, just like we do with these? charts and graphs, you know, uh, tables are also included too. <laughs> okay. Um, act, actually, um, I'd like to focus everyone's attention to the uh, red rectangle there on the bottom left, uh, which will um, just expand in the next. Um, slide here. And when we look at this, uh, we see the numbers uh, from 19 to 35. Those are the, uh, uh, the perijove num uh, numbers. Um, so we've just had our, next, our last close approach to Jupiter, which was perijove 31. And you can see the date there, which is uh, the end of December. And you can see that in kind of like blue, uh, the next two uh, planned uh, perijoves are 32 and 33. And then there's an extra orbit in green. And then there's that um, the orbit, which is that green line that we saw in the previous um, uh, image. So that would, would take place in, uh, in July, and that would be the end of the mission. But the good news is that NASA has decided to extend the mission for another five, actually uh, until 2025. Uh, so for another four years, which is really great. And if we look at the next slide, we can see uh, the extra orbits that will happen. Um, after 35, and, and these are gonna be really interesting. Um, in the blue, we can see the perigeos 34 to uh, 45, and one of them uh, in the earlier perigeos 34 uh, will be, uh, Juno will actually uh, pass by uh, the uh, Galilean moon uh, Ganymede, and in 45, uh, it'll be Europa, and uh, then 58 uh, by time, um, will be uh, Io. So, this is really exciting. We go to the next slide, we can see these Galilean moons that they will visit. On the left there is an orange uh, yellow moon, uh, which is Io. Uh, that will get uh, two uh, flybys of, uh, of uh, Juno. Uh, the icy moon Europa um, will, be, uh, will be three uh, flybys. And then there'll be 11 flybys of the moon Ganymede. And that is it, unfortunately. Uh, the moon on the uh, right there, which is uh, Callisto, um, does not get a pass. Sorry, get Callisto. So, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's it's because it's out of range of uh, Juno's uh, um, uh, uh, orbits, and it's actually uh, the furthest moon of the Galilean moons from uh, Jupiter. Now, this is very interesting because the data gathered by Juno uh, of these moons will pave the mission. Will actually pave 
um, the way for future missions, uh, Europa Clipper, which is a mission to uh, study the subsurface ocean of uh, Europa, will launch uh, sometime in uh, 2025. And then the other mission, uh, which is going to be launching next year, is called JUICE, which stands for uh, Jupiter um, Icy Moon Explorer. And uh, this spacecraft will visit uh, Ganymede, uh, Callisto, and, um, and Europa. Uh, but um, this time, uh, Io doesn't get a pass. So, so that's Oh, it. well. Yeah. Well, another mission that got extended, um, NASA did a review of these missions, was the InSight mission at Mars. It's been extended by two years through December of 2022. So we will continue to measure the Martian crust, listen for seismic waves, that's Martian quakes. It has a little uh, microphone on it, actually. They published a picture of the surface with you could hear the Martian winds kind of beating up against the microphone. Um, but what didn't make it was the mole. The mole, it was a digging device. It was supposed to dig down into the Martian soil, uh, measure the conductivity of it, the thermal conductivity, that is, how temperature flows. It could never get a grip, so to speak. You know, come on, mole, get a grip. And it just couldn't do it. The dirt, the sand there just is too slick, it seems. It was supposed to pound its way down, hold onto the dirt as it lifted upwards, pound its way down. And instead, it just kind of kept wiggling back upwards. So the mole they gave up on, they're not gonna waste any more effort on it, very sad, but they did learn something about Mars nonetheless, that not all Mars soil is alike. It's a little bit of a mystery why this soil didn't behave like other Martian soils. They didn't just assume this would work. They based it off of the experiments and measurements we've made across Mars at our other landing sites. So something still to be learned here, a little bit of a mystery, but insight will continue for a couple of years. So Chris, um, off to you again. Thank you so much for joining us here. And your oh first mission, your, your first mission on your return is to tell <laughs> us all about Apollo 14. Um, you know, of course, we've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions uh, before pandemic, before we went home, before retirements are hitting us. Mm -hmm. We had a whole uh, very active plan about celebrating these each in, in large ways. Well, we had to scale back a little bit until I realized we had Chris Butler with us. Um, he is an artist extraordinaire. Many of the planetarium shows you've seen in our own Samuel Ocean Planetarium have artwork. In fact, uh, much of it is done by Chris Butler. Uh, much of the stuff you see in other programming we do has his fingerprints on it. If you've been to our galleries in our, in, in our museum portion here at our observatory, uh, a lot of his work is there too. So we are just thrilled to have the other side of his expertise, which is like, you know, being able to speak and being able to tell the public um, what's going on. So what happened at Apollo 14? We know that 13 is the one that didn't make it so well, and uh, 14, I take it, did. So to you, Chris, take it over. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. Um, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my father was uh, an en engineer and a contract administrator for North American Aviation at uh, Downey, California, and he assisted in the building of the original spacecraft and stuck around for the entire Apollo program. He was there from 1962 to 1985, in fact, even into the shuttle era. And so for me, I, I learned a lot about the Apollo program in the old days and got a chance to meet lots of the flight crews and hear some inside stories. I will be sharing at least one of those uh, as regards Apollo 14. Um, there are a lot of untold stories and there are a lot of missions that people don't know as much about. Apollo 11 is famous because they landed the first time and they got some samples and so on. But a lot of people don't know that all the first flights of Apollo were test flights to see if the hardware worked, to see if we could do the basic things. And Apollo 11 was not a science mission. It was a test of the lunar module to see if it could land on the moon safely and the crew could be returned to Earth. And that worked. Of course, they got some samples while they were there. The next mission, Apollo 12, was also a test flight in a lot of ways because they had to test if the, the Apollo system could land you where the scientists really wanted to go, not just someplace but someplace in particular. So they didn't land at a high profile science target. They landed next to a robotic space probe, Surveyor 3, that had landed on the moon before and proved Apollo could go where you really want to go. 
it was the next flight that was going to be the first real hardcore science flight, a top level objective that the scientists really wanted. And that would have been where our story starts on Apollo 13. Uh, Apollo 13 is the flight before Apollo 14. A lot of ways Apollo 14 is famous for being the one after the close call on Apollo 13. In fact, the crew of Apollo 14 was supposed to be the crew of Apollo 13. Alan Shepard, Edgar Mitchell, and Stu Russo, you see in the picture there, Stu's the redhead. Uh, Al is in the back, he's the commander. And walking on the moon with Al will be Ed Mitchell there. They were originally slated to be on the crew of Apollo 13, but because of uh, some delays and some uh, extra training that this crew received, they got bumped to Apollo 14 a decision that obviously they were pretty happy about later. So it falls to these guys to be the recovery mission after Apollo 13. 13, as you may know, if you've seen the film and everything else, is a flight where the service module, that's the part right behind the cone-shaped part where the astronauts fly, it suffered an explosion between the Earth and the Moon. The hydrogen oxygen fuel cells that generated electric power, there was a short circuit, there was an explosion and the crew had to limp home. They didn't get to land on the moon. It was a very close call, but they did get them back home. Now, Apollo 14's astronauts weren't on board, but that doesn't mean they weren't involved. In fact, this is in mission control during the Apollo 13 accident. You're seeing there are lots of astronauts there hunched over trying to be helpful. Well, seated right in the front is Alan Shepard, the commander of Apollo 14. Right behind him, that's Ed Mitchell, the lunar module pilot from Apollo 14. So they tried to be helpful during this accident, but of course the main thing for them, they wanted to make sure it didn't happen to them. Their spacecraft, which was uh, the next command service module down the line, uh, it was modified extensively to prevent the kinds of problems that happened on Apollo 13. Apollo 13's command service module was called Odyssey, if you may remember. This one was called Kitty Hawk. Uh, the lunar lander uh, for the Apollo 14 mission was named Antares, which happens to be one of my favorite stars. January 31st, 1971 was the 50th or was the uh, launch of Apollo 14. We just had the uh, anniversary there. So we had a delay of about a year and Apollo 14 got us back into the business. Of course, everyone breathed a big sigh of relief when they got into orbit, fired the engines and headed off towards the moon, leaving Earth orbit. Here's an example of a story on Apollo 14 most of you probably don't know. After leaving Earth orbit, the command service module leaves the top of the third stage of the rocket, turns around, and then docks nose to nose with the lunar module and pulls it out of the third stage. They call it transposition and docking. What you may not know, this critical event didn't work on Apollo 14. The command module stuck its nose in the top of Antares and the latches didn't close. They bounced right back out, so they tried it again and the latches didn't close and they bounced right out. They tried it again, same thing. They backed off, they went back in, they tried again, they bounced out again. In the end, on the sixth try, the, the command module was able to move a little bit faster. They basically pushed the gas a little bit, pushed the nose in harder and it worked they linked up with the lunar module. Without that, there would be no landing on Apollo 14. But more than that, I remember my father talking about this when it happened. If any of you have ever stuck your keys in the door and they were resisting, they weren't going in quite right, and finally you push harder and you get the key to go in the door, you know what the first thing you do, right? You pull it back out because you're afraid you might have jammed it in there so hard it won't disengage. If the crew had been unable to dock with the lunar module, that just means you don't walk on the moon. It's embarrassing. But if the lunar module had been stuck on the nose of Kitty Hawk and they could not disengage it, it might mean the crew couldn't come home. They couldn't re-enter successfully. This is a good example of the kinds of close calls that happened all through the Apollo program that most people today don't know about.
So there were close calls. The place they were going for the first real science mission was the same place Apollo 13 was supposed to go but couldn't land at. It's a place called Fra Mauro. Fra Mauro is a crater just about in the center of the face of the moon. You can see it in the, uh, in the map there. The important thing about it is the thing labeled Mar Imbrium. Mar Imbrium, one of the lunar seas, the Sea of Rains, if your Latin is a little rusty, uh, is a 700 mile across super crater that's been filled in with lava. But it blasted material out of the moon from the moon's earliest days, maybe the very beginning of the moon. And it threw this stuff out across the surface of the moon. It wasn't Mar Imbrium where Apollo 13 and then 14 were going to go. It was the stuff thrown out from that. You see the very wrinkly, bumpy looking stuff. Mar Imbrium would be on the horizon up at the top. This is the material that was blasted out of the moon and thrown across. And where the yellow X is, the Fra Mauro formation, is where Apollo 14 was going to land. Now, Apollo 11's landing site, Apollo 11's spot in the Sea of Tranquility was picked because it was flat and safe to land. Apollo 12's landing site in the sea, the ocean of storms was picked because it was flat and safe to land. Oh, and there was a robot probe to aim for. But Apollo 13 and then 14 were headed into rough terrain. That's important. That's where the real science is in mountains and valleys and places like that on the moon. So Apollo 14 was going to be going into riskier territory and it's only on 13 and 14 we felt like we could do that. Here's a map for you. This is called a traverse map. This is where the astronauts are going to be walking, all right? And it shows at lower left on your screen Green. There's a little crosshair, circle with a cross through it, marked LM. That's where Antares would be, the lunar module. And then you can see, marked out with arrows, where the astronauts are going to walk, and they're going to walk uphill up to the upper, uh, upper right. You see something labeled Cone Crater. Cone Crater is a crater that's about 2,000 feet across. It's a pretty good-sized crater. It has blasted into the Fram Maro Formation, uh, millions and millions of years ago and dug up a good collection of all the things that are in the Fra Mauro formation. It's thrown them up and out. You don't have to go inside the crater. It's thrown them up and out onto the landscape. And Al and Ed have to go up there and sample that. The closer they get to the crater, the deeper the materials will have been dug up from. So that's their mission. And then to walk back to it, there'll be a total of two, space, uh, two, two moonwalks the first one close to the lunar module. The second one is this hike. And I wanna give you a sense of scale. Those of you who live in the Los Angeles area and have been to the observatory, uh, if you go to a map of Griffith Park here, picture stop in your car, not up at the observatory, but at the extreme lower left there, you'll see a little hiker, uh, a red symbol there, down at Ferndale, out where Western Canyon links up with Los Feliz Boulevard. The hike that Al and Ed had to undertake, both in distance and in climb, was the equivalent of hiking to the Griffith Observatory from that position. The previous mission had never gotten more than 600 feet away from the lunar module. This flight was going to be one mile up one mile to this, the summit of Cone Crater, one mile back, and a climb of no less than 500 feet. That's impressive. It's audacious. It was dangerous in some ways. They were going to definitely get a workout on this hike. To help the crew, they were going to have to carry a bunch of things. And for the first time, Apollo astronauts were going to be going far from their limb. How to help them out? Well, they came up with the idea of a lunar rickshaw, they called it, actually the Modular Equipment Transporter, or MET. Uh, and you can see there in this concept art for Apollo 14 that that's what they're doing. They're carrying tools, equipment, cameras, sample bags, all kinds of things on this MET. Now, the question is, though, how is that really going to work? The crew practiced with it. Here it's in the Vomit Comet you might have heard about. The airplane can not only simulate 0G, but also 16G. And the crew, this is uh, Ed giving a try, pulling the rickshaw. Um, 
they found that it tended to bounce and bump around a lot. They weren't so sure this was going to work. Well, the backup pair of astronauts, the uh, Gene Cernan and Joe Engel, they bet Al and Ed a case of beer that they'd have to give up on the Met and leave it somewhere, just abandon it. The astronauts weren't sure this was going to work. Now, another close call on the way in, right before landing, as they're circling the moon, preparing for Al and Ed to go down to the moon, uh, an alarm came on that the lunar module's computer was having a glitch that could trigger an abort and force them to go back into space and cancel the landing. Um, I won't go into the details, but the main thing is that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology goes down as heroes for all time for the fastest, longest distance tech support call ever. They were able to rewrite computer codes to prevent a problem and to send the instructions to the astronaut to make the astronauts in space to make changes so that the landing could happen. They did land safely, and that's the anniversary we're observing today, February 5th, 1971, 50 years ago today. This is a picture of Al Shepard, America's first man in space. You might remember he had that one mission before that. Uh, he'd only spent 15 minutes in space before on a straight up and down suborbital flight, but here he makes it all the way to the moon. At age 47, he was the oldest man to walk on the moon. Uh, the first word somebody said to him the minute he stepped onto the moon was, not bad for an old man, 47. Uh, that's not old. They set up scientific experiments, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, or ALSEP. You can see some of those instruments here. And lurking in the background dangerously at upper left, yep, that's it. That's the lunar rickshaw getting ready for the next day, the next moonwalk on the second day to go up to Cone Crater. Here's a picture of the, uh, the rickshaw halfway up the side of the crater. The terrain turned out to be uneven. It was much harder to figure out where you were. The slopes were impressive. The astronauts were able to do it, but their hearts were pounding. They were trying to navigate where they were. They were constantly talking about just how much fun it was to drag that rickshaw all the way up there. And in the end, because the terrain was so uneven and rocky in places, the astronauts didn't roll it, they carried it. They carried it part way up, partly because they wanted to have all their science equipment, but also because they didn't want to give a, a case of beer to Joe Engel and to Gene Cernan. Here's a picture of Ed part way up to the rim of Cone Crater, uh, looking at a Thomas guide. He actually is looking at a real map, but it was very hard to recognize things from the ground compared to pictures taken from orbit. The guys really weren't sure where they were. While we were up there, I do want to mention, uh, we at Griffith Observatory have a moon rock. It's an Apollo 14 moon rock. And it's a part of this rock, Big Bertha, sample 14321. This is a picture of it. Notice the tread marks from the rickshaw. Uh, this is the largest individual rock ever brought back from the moon. And it turns out to have an amazing secret just revealed in 2019. Part of this rock seems to be an earlier rock included within a later rock. And this small section of rock doesn't seem to be from the moon at all. It seems to be from the earth. It is the only one of its kind that's ever been identified because it's composed of granite and types of zircon crystals. Zircon, yeah. Um, it seems to be terrestrial, meaning that four billion years ago, a fragment of the Earth's crust was blown into space by some kind of a giant impact in our planet's infancy, blown into space and landed on the moon, was incorporated inside other lunar rocks and was waiting up there for Al and Ed to find. Not only is it the only Earth meteorite ever found on another planet so far, it's also the oldest Earth rock ever recovered. That's an interesting science result. Well, the boys were up at the top, um, somewhere near the lip of Cone Crater. They wanted to look into it. They couldn't tell where it was. This is a rock called Saddle Rock. 
and you can see there's a hammer and some other things lying on the rock. The guys are sitting there panting. Al Shepard's heart rate was at 150 beats a minute and mission control finally said, just knock it off. I'm sure you're close. The samples will tell us all we need to know. But the question in their minds is how close? How close did we really get? Well, today we know. This is a picture taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter just a couple of years ago. And if you look very carefully, you can see, for example, near the lunar module down at the LM at the, uh, the lower left, you can see the dark streaks of the astronaut's footprints. Cone Crater is there at upper left, and the V arrow points to Saddle Rock. They were only about 100 feet from the edge of the crater. It turns out it really doesn't make much difference to the science, but it still was a disappointment. The thing that most people know, people remember about Apollo 14, apart from it being the one after 13, is that Alan Shepard, seen here, screen center, very slightly to the right, is swinging a long uh, geology tool that has a genuine six iron on the end of it, and he hit two golf balls on the moon. Now he claimed they went, as he said, miles and miles and miles. But looking at photographs taken after the moonwalks from the lunar module before they left, we've been able to spot the golf balls. And the answer is about 40 feet for the first ball and 120 feet for the second ball. A little astro exaggeration. The crew did come home safely, which is, well, probably part of the reason most people have never heard of Apollo 14. It was a successful mission. It brought back a lot of lunar samples and it ticked a lot of boxes. What were we able to do? First, Apollo 14 demonstrated that the changes, the corrective actions after Apollo 13 provided a safe ride. So that was good. We fixed those difficulties. It was the first exploration of a key lunar science site that the scientists had picked. They deployed lunar science experiments on the surface. They tested that modular equipment transport. We didn't bring one the next time. We brought the four-wheeled lunar car, the LRV, which is a much better way to bring your stuff with you. Um, we returned 94.35 pounds of lunar samples, including that amazing one that turns out to be from Earth. And it was the first demonstration of lunar golfing. So that's the mission of Alan Shepard, Stuart Rusa, and Edgar Mitchell, America's third lunar landing, but of course not the end. And we'll be observing more of those anniversaries as we go because there are more missions yet ahead. Anyway, there's a little primer for you. I hope that was helpful. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. Yeah, that was great, Chris. Thank you very much. It's, it's fascinating to know that our very own moon rock came from a larger rock that had a chunk of earth rock in it and I you was know, like to say it's not a moon rock it's cubic zirconia so anyway <laughs> that's your comment right. that so, do you remember much from that flight uh i remember bits of it um the dominant yeah. memory that i had i guess i was about six years old uh i was watching the uh walk up to cone crater and listening to the astronauts voices and i was becoming concerned i remember asking my father is this okay are they okay because they seemed confused and lost and stressed and they were huffing and puffing i was getting frightened as a child i didn't really understand what was going on my father said i remember he said i think it's okay i think it's okay and as a kid i remember that was a scary thing to hear dad say yeah for sure well thank you chris my um, welcome back to All Space Considered, a wonderful first report on your return. So Patrick, on to you and our February sky report. Uh, yes. What's up in the sky? Uh, yeah, uh, we'll return to this uh, picture um, here um, um, in the middle of the sky report. But um, on the theme of the moon, let's uh, go to the next slide here. You can see the moon as a four-day-old uh, crescent uh, on the 15th, uh, around about seven o'clock uh, over in the southwest. And if you're a moon watcher and you come back the next night at the same time, we can see that it moves. The moon moves uh, roughly about 12 degrees um, each night um, across the sky. And actually it, it um, has a motion, a velocity of uh, uh, 2,300 miles per hour. So imagine that. Let's go to the next uh, slide as we see it's fast approaching another planet. Um, and this uh, planet of course is Mars. And let's go to the next slide here. 
On the 18th, the moon will be uh, positioned uh, right below Mars. And this, as you look at Mars on that night uh, with the moon below it, um, this is actually a special day for Mars because earlier on in that date, on that day, um, uh, the Perseverance rover will be landing on the surface of Mars. And uh, this would be a really, you know, momentous um, moment. And another, um, uh, another in the history of the exploration of, um, of Mars. So let's go back to the next slide here. And as you gaze upon Mars, Mars will be roughly about 205 million kilometers from, from the Earth. And the signal from that rover would take about 11 minutes to reach the Earth. Now, what else is in the sky? Well, if we look over just to the south or to the left of Mars and the moon, uh, there is a constellation called Orion. And if you're starting out learning the sky, this is a really good one to learn. Uh, Orion is easily recognized by its three stars in a row. It's Orion Hunter, so this is a hunter's belt. There are also two stars above Orion's belt, as we see in the next slide, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix. Be Betelgeuse, as you recall, was kind of faint and dim last year. Now it's uh, brightened up to its normal uh, brightness. Um, below Orion's belt are two other stars, uh, Saif and uh, Rigel, which is a brilliant blue star. Now take a look at this pattern here and uh, notice the lines that uh, join it. If you were to go out into the real sky and we'll take a look here, we'll come to that, back to that picture. Um, here's Orion, see if you can recognize it by joining the lines between the stars. And there, there it is. There's the familiar pattern of Orion. So once you found Orion, you can use the three stars in its belt as a pointer. And uh, if you go downwards in, the, in this direction in the next slide, you'll find the brightest star in the night sky called Sirius. Orion also has a, uh, a nebula and it's located right beneath the belt. It's called the Orion Nebula or Messier 42. And it's one of the brightest nebulas in the night sky. Uh, you can see it easily uh, with your eyes um, as a faint kind of cloudy patch or luminous patch in the sky. Uh, or and a pair of binoculars or even a telescope will uh, give you a picture of an enormous cloud of gas uh, with newborn stars in the center. This nebula is located roughly about 1300 uh, light years from the Earth. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide here. So once you find Orion, uh, look for Orion's neighbors here, uh, which is um, all the constellations uh, in blue. All right, so we're gonna to move to the morning sky. And in the morning sky, um, Orion has disappeared. It's already set far below the Western horizon. And what you see here, um, if you take a morning stroll, are stars that you normally see in the uh, spring and summer, uh, starting with the reddish uh, or orange star, Arcturus and Boötes the Herdsman. Looking a little bit further down, uh, just above the southern horizon, is uh, Spica in the constellation of uh, Virgo the Maiden. And the final star is Antares, which is uh, Chris's uh, uh, favorite star in the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion. At the end of the month, uh, this is gonna be a really challenging uh, observation. If you're up early in the morning at 5.30, uh, you're gonna see three planets just uh, above the, um, the uh, east-southeast horizon. It's gonna be a challenge because Jupiter um, will be just about one degree above the horizon. So you need a clear view, an unobstructed view in that direction, and probably a pair of binoculars to find the three planets. So that is that. And next is, uh, is the um, moon phases. So um, last night we had the last quarter moon. The next up is the new moon. And um, first quarter is on the 19th. And um, I think oh, I'm missing the full moon. Anyway, the full moon will occur a week later. So that's your sky report for, the, for this month. Muted. Uh, the mute symbols at me. So I'm muted, obviously, as they're being like, we can't hear you. I'm blabbering on about our member exclusive that's going to be coming. Um, like Patrick was saying, on February 18th, the uh, Perseverance Lander is going to be hopefully landing on Mars successfully. It'll get there one way or another. But on the 17th, you have an opportunity to hear us talk about what's going to happen. 
uh, our support group Friends of the Observatory is hosting an inside scoop uh, for our members. So if you like this sort of stuff, if you're enjoying what you're seeing tonight, join us on the 17th at 7 p.m. and we're going to tell you what's going to happen and how perseverance is different than curiosity what the mission's about it's going to be a lot of fun and there is information i believe in the chat i think our moderators have probably put it in there on how to join but also if you just look at the video information on the youtube channel there's a link there to become a member today and then you can get your reservation to join us at the Inside Scoop on the 17th. And then believe it or not, on the 18th, we are hosting a Mars landing party. We're gonna have a viewing party at Griffith Observatory, well, virtually at Griffith Observatory, and we will tell you how to join us there at a later time. But you won't wanna miss the night before to know what you're seeing and hearing the following day. That's where you'll get all that background information and you can be the one amongst your friends that knows what's happening and you can say no 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 it's that there is a helicopter there there actually is and yes there's microphones and yes there's cameras we'll be able to get pictures of the helicopter flying in the sounds I, i'm not kidding it's a crazy mission gonna be awesome so um we'd like to move along um we have a a, a couple of remembrances before we move on to some pretty pictures and then we'll celebrate tony um tom labange a former council member of ours very important to, to all of us at Griffith Observatory and Griffith Park. And our museum guide, Jeff, who's, who's joining us here, put together a very nice little remembrance. And we're going to let him tell some of the things he discovered. And then we'll all chime in a little bit with some of the things that we uh, greatly enjoyed about him. But it's uh, sad news that he's no longer with us. But let's celebrate a little bit about Tom's life. Um, so Jeff, what did you learn yeah. when you did a little research? So uh, Tom Labonge, a much beloved figure in uh, sort of the, this area of Los Angeles and especially uh, in Griffith Park, uh, passed away unexpectedly uh, January 7th uh, at the age of 67. Uh, he's well known among employees of Griffith Observatory as sort of a larger than life uh, and larger in life figure. Uh, but I learned a lot about his contributions to the city itself. He was the uh, city council person for our district, District 4, from 2007 to 2015. And the only reason he didn't do it longer is that he termed out. He got to the term limit. Uh, and he's an amazing guy. Let's go ahead and uh, pop over to the next slide. Yeah, one thing I learned, he is responsible for those cute little Los Angeles Riversides. He was walking uh, around the area one day and realized that there is no, there was no good signage saying that, hey, Los Angeles has a river where they're trying to beautify parts of it. Uh, and now when I say he's responsible for things, he had a hand in pretty much everything going on in this area of Los Angeles, whether it's just, you know, a little touch, a nudge, or just full involvement. He's been involved in quite a lot. Uh, he had a hand in identifying the uh, a good place for the satellite facility during Griffith Observatory's renovation. Uh, he had a hand in the 100 acre expansion of Griffith Park to include the Cahuenga Peak where uh, near the Hollywood sign. Uh, he had a hand in, well, he's always been a prominent sort of proponent of seismic safety, earthquake safety as well. And it's not just these sort of policy Los Angeles decisions that he's been a part of, it's also been a very personal part of our park as well. Uh, if you go to the next one, he's very frequently seen in his off time on the upper left there, you see that's from, you know, that's a photo shoot, but he very frequently just went around the park to pick up trash. Uh, according to some people, he has been, he had been spotted uh, in the bushes in Ferndale pulling up invasive plants. Uh, this man deeply, deeply cared for the park and did quite literally everything he could uh, to take care of it. Uh, and the thing is, I said, or I mentioned earlier that a lot of our employees have stories. I'd like to turn it over to some of our other presenters because we all have Tom LaBonge stories here. <laughs> yeah, um, in fact, the, the picture on the right-hand side there is of Tom during the great conjunction that was on the winter solstice on the 21st of December. He often would come up and um, just inter introduce our speakers. He was no longer our city council member there, but he did show up and we have a little audio clip. Ladies and gentlemen, him. it's my honor to introduce the great director of the Grizzly Observatory, Dr. Ed Krupp. 
Thank you very much, Tom LaBonge, one of the best friends Griffith Park has. Yeah, so I was up on the roof. Um, we were live streaming the the sunset at the solstice, and I hear Tom LaBonge is down there. And I was like, oh, goodness, I hope they give him the mic. Sure enough, our, our director, Dr. Krupp, hands him the mic and gets an intro from him, as always. And it was that, you know, comforting sound of Tom LaVange's voice on the speaker down below coming over our live stream. It, it felt like being back at Griffith Observatory after we hadn't done very many events due to COVID. Um, so it, it was a common occurrence. Patrick, you have you have memories as well. Yeah, uh, a, a few years back, uh, we were streaming, live streaming a, a lunar eclipse uh, from the uh, Zeiss uh, telescope on the roof. And uh, it was roughly about four, maybe 4.30 in the morning. And um, uh, we, uh, we took a little break. Um, I, oh, David, you were there too. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Downley was there as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, Tony. And- yeah. um, Tony up keeping so, the image center. Yeah, um, I happened to be uh, looking at the city um, just from the roof. And uh, I heard someone uh, say, who's up there? <laughs> And I, I told him, you know, I, I told him, you know, who were, who were the Danley came up and, and he identified himself as um, Tom LaBonge, who was taking an early morning uh, hike. So we invited him up to the telescope dome so he can uh, look um, at the uh, lunar eclipse through our telescope. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was often seen carrying a football, walking through the park um, with his football. So, you know, he was... He was very, very important to, to us at Griffith Observatory, and he was, he was very much a champion for the park, for the observatory, um, beyond his time as a council member. So he's certainly going to be missed. Um, I do oh. want to make sure that I, uh, I mentioned something that he did. Actually, uh, this is a good picture for it, because looking out that way, you'll see the, uh, uh, the restroom complex out there and when we were doing our redesign of course we had that massive renovation that we did and there were a million things for the architects to be thinking about but i do remember when uh senior staff was talking about the fact that uh, tom labange had noticed we had not yet planned for outdoor restrooms that could be used by the hikers who use the trails and so it was at his suggestion that these were included uh, into the plan. And so his thoughtfulness for the people using the wider natural uh, setting of Griffith Park is the reason we see those there today. So I hope everybody, when they see those, remembers him and remembers his thoughtfulness uh, for the hikers. Yeah, also if you saw the space shuttle from, uh, I mean the Endeavor when it arrived in Los Angeles from the observatory, that was also partly thanks to him because uh, he made all the traffic arrangements at the last minute so that people wouldn't be stranded here either trying to get in or out. As I recall, it sort of were anyway, but it would have been total chaos if he hadn't taken quick action on that. And uh, so, you know, he, he really did things and expected them to be done immediately if, if it was an important issue. Yeah. And, so uh, Jeff, the last thing you found is, is really rather touching and I yeah. think we can all remember this. Yeah, just a little over a week ago, uh, Mayor Garcetti uh, announced that the, the, the peak of Mount Hollywood, just uh, north of the observatory, that the peak of the mountain was going to be renamed from Mount Hollywood Summit to Tom LaBonge Summit, uh, which is a very touching thing because Tom LaBonge always loved hiking in the park and that that summit there is one of the biggest hiking destinations uh, that you can go to. Uh, Tom LaMange is going to be deeply missed by, uh, by all of us in the moderator chat, the secret moderator chat, we're sort of sharing our stories with each other. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a, it's a really tough thing. Tom LaMange was very much a spirit of the park. And I just want to close it out by saying that, you know, if half of our elected officials were half as good as this man, then the world would have a lot less problems. Yeah, well, thank you, Jeff, for putting that together for us. <clears throat> um, we're all going to miss Tom LaBonge. And I know from Griffith Observatory, all of our staff had uh, just was very thankful we were doing this tonight and, you know, is, is remembering Tom in the right way. So we do have one more remembrance we want to talk about. And, and Tony, you, you actually knew uh, General Chuck Yeager in terms of at least you communicated a little bit with them via some social media more than I think anybody else here did. So 
why don't you tell us about um, a little bit about why he's famous sure. and what we should remember about yeah, well, General Yeager? First of all, uh, Chuck Yeager is certainly one of the most famous pilots and uh, you know one of the greatest test pilots ever. And, uh, and you know, I think he's a name that we all know. Uh, just a little bit about him. He uh, started flying during World War II. He signed up, you know, immediately after Pearl Harbor, and um, worked as an aircraft mechanic. Then he got interested in flying, although he he actually vomited on his first flight, <laughs> as many people do. Um, but he, uh, you know, went off to uh, fight, uh, defend, you know, trying to fight the Germans over France. Um, he ended up being shot down in a Mustang. He uh, hid and he joined the French underground and worked his way back eventually to, so he could make his way to England. Um, uh, now, usually in World War II, that would, you've done your duty if you've done that, and you especially wouldn't be sent back to the same place because uh, you know if, if you knew about the French underground, you wouldn't survive or you wouldn't want to survive being captured again. So, but he didn't care. He he actually went directly to Gen General Eisenhower and insisted on being put back. And he said, whatever I knew about the French underground is out of date by now, because they change things so quickly that I don't have any valuable information. So, uh, so he got put back in and he became a great ace. Um, he claimed the first jet he ever saw, he shot down because the Germans were uh, you know, testing jets and he, he caught one. Um, and so he was already quite a renowned flyer by that time. But then he went back to Muroc Air, Force, Air Base here in California, which got changed later to Edwards Air Force Base, the name I mean, and uh, started testing planes like crazy. And one of the big projects was trying to fi fly faster than sound. For some reason, planes kept breaking up when they approached the sound barrier, or, you know, roughly 700 miles per hour. So it seemed like it was really a, a challenge to to get through that, but um, uh, with a lot of study of aerodynamics and stuff, the Bell uh, Corporation made a rocket-powered plane uh, that could be dropped from a B-29 bomber, and Hager uh, uh, volunteered to sign up for this project um, and became the first to break the sound barrier on October 14th, 1947, which was also the, about the same month the Air Force became separate from the Army. So, uh, so that was a great feat of the Air Force. Then he got into battles with uh, rivals, I should say, with like the Navy over flying faster. The Navy broke the sound barrier at Mach 2, or twice the speed of sound. So uh, the, he, he planned it so that the day that they, the Scott Crossfield, the guy who made Mach 2, was honored. Uh, he broke that record just before the honor was given to the new fastest man on Earth because he didn't want to fall behind. So he had a lot of rivalry with people, um, and he, he flew just about everything. Uh, about the only X plane he didn't fly was the X-15. Um, but uh, he... He ended up training or training Air Force pilots to be astronauts. In 1962, he got put in charge of what's called the Aerospace Research Pilot School, the test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base. The idea was the Air Force was going to make their own astronauts. Um, and there was a contract actually with Griffith Observatory where those groups would come in 15 at a time and 30 people per year. Uh, would get star training from Clarence Clemenshaw, and that went on until 1970. So, uh, Jaeger only taught there till about 1966. But um, anyway, so you know he he stayed very active that way. Um, he didn't have a high opinion actually of astronauts. He thought he he thought their flights were too easy compared to flying a jet. Um, <laughs> so he had he very famous comments about, you know, flying in things left behind by chimpanzees and stuff. And um, so he didn't have a real great relationship with all astronauts, although he trained some of the best ones. And like Dave Scott, who is another person I correspond with quite a bit, was actually one of his, fa one of Chuck Yeager's favorite students. Hmm. Um, 
Now we do have some footage here of him on a oh, flight. You yes. want to tell us a little bit about yeah, what, well, what went on just, in this? Yeah, I'll tell you briefly. This is connected with ARPS. This is a F-104 Starfighter, but it's been modified with a rocket engine. It, Chuck Yeager was going to try to make a new, you know, jet uh, altitude record of something like 21 miles, but uh, he, he actually didn't go in quite the right course. The jet stalled and he had to eject out of it. And if you've seen the movie, The Right Stuff, you know that his uh, seat, his uh, ejection seat actually bashed into his helmet and set his helmet on fire. He lost part of a finger and scorched his face. But he uh, actually went through very painful treatment of actually having the scar tissue sanded as it was forming and went through a couple months of agony, but it actually came out with almost no trace of any scarring, which is pretty amazing. Um, three months after that accident, he shows up at Griffith Observatory, again, because of our connection with the students that, of his that we were teaching and uh, dedicated the new planetarium projector uh, that replaced the original one that we had. So this is in March, 1964. And you see Jaeger in the center there standing to, to the right in the picture is Clarence Clemenshaw and uh, also the head of, uh, of the Recreation and Parks, his last name was Fredrickson, looking up at this new projector, which Jaeger told the first audience of it, uh, yeah, it'll never fly. <laughs> so, so, but Very anyway. fair. <laughs> so. Typical, typical Chuck Jaeger. So yeah. in any case, you did have a little bit of correspondence on Twitter with him. Um, yeah, I actually, for one thing, wanted to know about this. And of course, in a career like his, I think dedicating a planetarium probably wasn't one of the most memorable things. And he goes, yeah, I got to tell you, that was 60 some years ago and, uh, you know, one afternoon. And I just don't really remember that much about that particular thing. But he, he uh, you know, did certainly remember a lot of things. And he was great on Twitter. You didn't want to get into an argument with him on Twitter um, <laughs> because he, he could be very cutting in very few words. But it was always very fun to read his stuff. And, uh, oh. and and he actually actually went out of that and then fought like in Vietnam and uh, against India, I guess, with the Pakistanis or something. And and when they captured pilots, you know, Indian pilots in this case, they would go, "You're Chuck Yeager," and then the prisoners would want his 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 autograph and stuff. So. <laughs> It's very funny, very funny. Well, thank you, Tony, for bringing us that uh, remembrance of Chuck Yeager, a real American hero, certainly, and, uh, you know, one of, one of those Americans in the history books that larger than life, but in a way that was really who he was, you yeah. know, you see read these characters in films, but read his biography, Yeager, and also Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, which are both, you know, different portraits of him. Yeah, like absolutely. Him. It's good stuff. And now we want to move on to our pretty picture section and we're going to have Katie lead this pretty picture section and it's pretty pictures with Katie tonight. So Katie, <laughs> take it away and tell us what we're seeing here. Awesome. And by the way, Katie is one of our producers of the show. She's our lead producer, does a wonderful job making sure all of this stuff gets put together. So I just want to thank you officially mid show here, Katie, for all the hard work and making this all possible. So take it away with all this pretty stuff we're going to see. Thanks. So here we have NASA APOD image. This is NGC 1316 called After Galaxies Collide. And we have a beautiful image of the Southern Cross over the Chilean volcano. This is massive nearby spiral galaxy NGC 2841, NASA image. Here we have the moon by David Pinsky, one of our museum guides. And the snow covered mountains near the Cajun Pass on the high desert from Anthony Perkic. A few of them from him. Sort of Orion from Anthony. NGC 2244. These are all Anthony images. 
M81 and M82. And then we have Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles from museum guide Jared Donkersley. Beautiful pictures. And one more from him. Well, that is just terrific. Thank you so much, Katie, for bringing us those. We felt that having a little Katie in this show with so many men was important to have some female perspective on things. So thank you for bringing us all that, all those pretty pictures. And now we are at the part of the show where we're ready to move along and celebrate our very own Tony Cook. Um, Tony, you've been with Griffith Observatory a, a long time, much longer than I have. Um, you know, you've known Patrick for a long time, Chris, all sorts of stuff. And we thought, well, what could we do? How could we frame this to make it sort of fun? And we thought, well, let's go with something that most of us have never actually seen. Let's use. This is your life, Tony. Uh, so first of all, it started all the way back in 1935 when you attended the opening of Griffith Observatory. I think you took some pictures at it. Um, so there's Tony standing off to the side in the background waiting for everything to happen. But seriously, of course, to really see Tony's contributions, besides that little joke, we need to take our own size telescope, point it into the sky and look back in time. Of course, the light waves have been leaving the earth, traveling off into space. So we're gonna peer ahead and take a look. What do we see here? Well, we see Doge in the, in the UFO. Back in the early uh, late seventies, we had Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 giving views of the earth and moon, inspiring Tony to join Griffith Observatory in 1978. I also heard that you became a telescope demonstrator in 1980. Do we have those dates right, Tony? And what can you tell us about those days? Well, um... Gosh, <laughs> I don't know if I can safely say much about those days. But, <laughs> no, no it, you know, you have to understand that this was like when the space shuttle was about to come out. So we were taking trips right off into Edwards Air Force Base. And like when the Enterprise was stationed there, we got to crawl all, all under the 747 and around the space shuttle. And we were trading trips there for laserium shows with the NASA staff because they didn't have oh. much entertainment out there. Oh, really? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. So are, are you thinking they can't fire me? Is, is that the reason you're telling well, the story? It was actually a perk that we had back then as being a guide is you could, you know, as long as you arranged it with your supervisor, you could have guests to the shows. So we, we pushed that as far as we could, I think, with uh, who we offered shows to. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's move along in time and see what else we have here to take a look at. That's right. Move along into the 70s and 80s, Voyager 1 encounters Saturn. That was an right. amazing now, encounter. Remember, this is all pre-internet area. So to see the Voyager pictures, we had to set up a microwave uh, relay from Mount Wilson to get JPL's rebroadcast. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Now, what about Halley's Comet coming back in 86? Well, oh gosh. Now this, we showed all the way from the end of October, 1985 until uh, May, 1986. And the hours were so long showing this that everybody's nerves were frazzled by the time it was done. But one of the things, so many people came up to the observatory to see it. Well, I took my trip to Australia then and the headlines in the papers were the lines at Griffith Observatory to see Halley's Comet. I could not get away from Griffith Observatory even in Australia. Uh, <laughs> it, it was on the news, it was, you know, McDonald's had, in Australia had a menu where you could win a trip to Los Angeles to see the famous Halley's Comet, even though it was much better in Australia. <laughs> so, Tony, uh, <laughs> Tony, you, you sh um, I, I know that um, in the past that you've uh, shared um, a story um, about Halley's Comet um, on your flight to Australia. Oh yeah, um, well, you know, even long before uh, Halley's Comet came, I was thinking, you know, it's going to be really low in the south, so how could you see it? And I was thinking, you know, an airliner would give you a view even when it was close to the sun to get your altitude and the darker sky and stuff. So I happened to be on a site survey thing to Australia to find out where to send amateur astronomers. I was actually working full time at a telescope store, part time as a guide. So this was through the telescope store. And I realized that this was like a week after it passed by the sun, it still lost 
almost in the glare. But I thought, what better place? I'm in a jet and, you know, 35,000 feet over the Pacific. I bet I could spot the comet early. So I asked the passenger if I could, you know, look through his window because it's almost dawn. And, and the guy said, no, all right. And I looked and a steward comes out. He goes, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Air New Zealand flight. I said, I'm looking for a comet. He goes, that wouldn't be Halley's Comet, would it? I said, uh, yes, it is. And he goes, just a minute, don't move. And he goes up, comes back, goes, the captain wants to see you on the flight deck. I go, me, what? <laughs> so I go up the spiral thing and up into the cockpit and then duck down, not hit the navigation stuff. And the guy says, so they tell me that you've seen Halley's Comet. Tell me it's altitude and azimuth. They go, oh, it's uh, about 97 degrees and about 13 degrees high. That fuzzy spot there. He goes, yes, thank you. From now on, we will tell our passengers where to look for it. <laughs> you know, it actually was like literally the second day that it had been visible from anywhere. Even Europeans were in the They only picked it up a few hours earlier. So, <laughs> so, I do I think it's, uh, it's funny that Tony goes on vacation to the other side of the world and is conducting star parties exactly, even in an aircraft, uh, just exactly like you do back at the office. This is not a career so much as it is a life avocation. You were even doing star parties for Australians out by Ayers Rock, if I remember right, showing right. them things through your telescope. Oh, yeah. Don't you ever leave work? Well, I'll tell you, when I came back, I was suntanned, I was wearing shorts, and I had a white t shirt black square on it that said what comet and I had a beard that was you know <laughs> 10 feet long and un, you know totally uncombed hair and everything and I walked towards the observatory and somebody on the lawn turned around to me and ran up and said do you work here Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> but I look like I do all right I guess so. you just look like that kind of guy who should Tony I'm yeah. sorry <laughs> well, Tony this is your life that's exactly what we're saying so Take yeah. another look here. We'll move along in our timeline. We're just in, yeah. you know, we're in the 80s still here. So we move along in the 80s. We reach the 90s. Voyager leave, Voyager 1 leaves the solar system, takes that amazing picture. But 94. Oh. Oh, my goodness. We had the Northridge earthquake and Shoemaker Levy 9 impacting Jupiter. So a couple of big events. How did that impact life at the observatory? Well, I mean, it shut it down for many weeks because the earthquake. Uh, I was actually not in town when that happened. I was in San Francisco, but um, I came back to it and within a few days, I was as shell-shocked as everybody who had been through it because there were so many aftershocks. Uh, I remember I was in the break room eating dinner where our, actually our production office is now, eating lunch, I mean, with people in a, a seven magnitude or a six, six magnitude uh, aftershock hit and I remember somebody going through a door and you could see the horizon framed in the door and it's swaying like a ship and I panicked I ran upstairs and I saw the Hugo Ballon paintings which had pulled out of their lateral supports swinging like a giant you know like a big bell almost and I was just absolutely terrified we actually got hit by two equal sized aftershocks within about a minute of each other so I was upstairs for the second one. But the building actually really wasn't damaged very much. It was overbuilt by people very concerned with seismology after the 1933 earthquake. So it came through pretty well. There were superficial things that tore loose and stuff. The exhibits were smashed. Um, uh, even our solar telescope, you know, the tracking mirrors were dangling off the side of the platform they're on. And it was pretty hair-raising. A lot of exhibits, I remember Patrick had to advise on... Uh, hazardous materials that had fallen out of our elements exhibit um, because the windows were all smashed and all the exhibits. So did, you, did you manage to get things put together to be able to show off Jupiter at all or at least talk about it to the public? Yeah so by July things are back to <laughs> normal and uh, uh, and I'll tell you actually the fun with that started a year before because we used to get these postcards from the International Astronomical Union and I opened the one that announced the discovery of this comet that was now trapped in orbit around Jupiter and that would no doubt be, that was already torn apart by gravity and then was doomed a year later to smash into Jupiter. And I remember showing it to supervisors, look, we're gonna get a collision with Jupiter. 
and the reaction, at least from one of my my boss actually at the time was, well, no one will ever see that. I go, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, it's on the night it's on the far side of Jupiter, and you know, Jupiter's so huge compared to a comet. What could that do? So I was kind of, I finally kind of developed the attitude. Well, no matter what happens, where are people going to go to find out about it? And of course, Griffith Observatory. So I was pushing for let's do everything we can, and everybody mm -hmm. else plan their vacation. Literally, the only full-time person besides me at the observatory was the shop supervisor and, and his staff. But uh, everybody else didn't want to be there for the big disappointment. So uh, I pretty much got to do what I wanted to that. I figured that too many people would want to look through the big scope on the roof. So instead, we would put TV cameras on that and CCD cameras and stuff and feed the image to all the other monitors in the building. Um, and we invited the astronomy clubs up, stuff like that. And that actually worked out really well. We had the biggest crowds for an astronomical event, I think, for a whole week during that time. And I remember mm -hmm the big moment when our first glimpse of his scar was supposed to appear. And I'm standing next to a TV monitor and there's this black bot spot that appears on Jupiter. And I go, oh no, I cleaned that CCD detector so carefully and here's a big glob of dirt right on the edge of Jupiter, right where we want to see what happened. And I was expecting there to be a bright cloud there. And I'm really apologizing to this giant crowd on the roof and all of a sudden, Kurt Palmer, the telescope demonstrator, comes and taps me on the shoulder. And he goes, Tony, I've been moving the telescope. It's moving on Jupiter. That's something from the collision. And I go, oh, my gosh. Ran downstairs, pushed somebody aside from one of the LA Astronomical Society telescopes and looked. And sure enough, you could see it. Um, now, I pushed politely, but I realized it might be a little hard for someone who hadn't seen Jupiter to see. But actually, it was very easy. And you know, just an amazing week. And yeah. day after day, we saw new scars. They modified as the wind blew around. And uh, we had the same consistent crowds night after night. Just amazing event. Yeah, well, you were there to bring it to Los Angeles. And that's what you've done your whole life. It really is. Earth-sized scars on Jupiter. And you yep. were there to help show it to our public. Just fantastic. Yep. So moving ahead. That my was father told me I, I was very fortunate that it turned out that way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So we get to 96, 97. We have a couple of more comets. And uh, one of them was a little more favorite of yours than the other. And we took a guess that it might have been Hale Bopp. Over. Well, actually, you guessed wrong. <laughs> yeah, see, I was joking that you would say that, that we had guessed wrong. And we, we stuck with this one. I thought the other one was more beautiful, actually. It was stretched across the sky. It was wispy. It was gorgeous. Hale Bopp was small and bright, and right. it was that's easily exactly, seen. That's exactly what I, which, you know, we only saw Hayakataki for a brief time because it kind of it swept by the earth and then kind of got lost near the sun. So I watched it, though, from when it could first be seen for the, I think it was like 10 days or so that it approached. And um, it was the day of the closest approach where I would leave Griffith when the park closed at 10 and I'd drive up to Whitaker Peak, you know, near Valencia when it used to be dark and a beautiful Milky Way there and all that. And the night it was closest, I literally almost fell over because the comet's tail was 70 degrees long from the Big Dipper, actually from the Little Dipper, well, Big Dipper, all the way to Virgo, uh, just one little streak of tail, but uh, just enormous in the sky. Yeah, it was in, it was incredible. I was at Santa Cruz at the time, and on the the building we were in was I think the old admin building. They had moved the astronomy and physics department because they were reinforcing ours from the earthquake that had happened in Santa Cruz. They were adding flying buttresses to the the space science building. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, I was up on top of that building at one in the morning, two in the morning, whatever it was, and we were just blown away by what we were seeing in yeah. that comet that night. It was yeah. it was an incredible sight. And, but Hale Bop um, is the one a lot of people remember, and that's the right. one we zoomed up on is the bright one. But let's move yeah. along. Yeah, that one to our... I took my honeymoon uh, during in Paris. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, good good choice there. So we've got uh, the renovation began in 2002. Mars was its closest in 60,000 years. Um, finally, Griffith Observatory reopens, and we debuted All Space Considered in 2008. Um, we had our diamond anniversary. We're moving along past a lot of stuff here. 
and the final shuttle mission in 2011, a transit of Venus and in 2012, that amazing endeavor flyover that was just incredible that you, you, you know, said, you know, Tom, we mentioned that Tom LaBonge made that endeavor possible by, you know, helping get people in and out of the park. If you look how crowded that hilltop is, but Tony, what are your memories of these things? The last shuttle flight and seeing the shuttle, was that an emotional time for you to see the shuttle end that way? Well, it was emotional. Now I had seen the shuttle many times at Edwards, but this actually seemed more like a funeral to me than, than actually coming to celebrate because it was probably, you know, an unflyable space shuttle that had been gutted and it was going to go to a museum. So it was exciting, of course, to see it over the observatory. And that was a great honor to grip at the observatory. Um, I mean, it, that was very intentional because uh, there is a connection with NASA and Los Angeles, grip at the observatory and the, and the, the science center. It's very deep. So um, uh, now I'm going to claim a tiny bit of credit, though. When I heard that Endeavor was going to fly into Los Angeles, I called people I knew at, at, Ed, at Edwards Air Force Base at the then Dryden Flight Center. And I said, have you considered where you're going to be flying the 747? And they said, well, of course, we can't release you know, classified information like that, and especially in this era. And I said, OK, well, whatever your plans are, please keep Griffith and Moore Observatory in mind because that's where people go in the city to see stuff in the sky. So no matter where you fly it, that's where people are gonna go. I said, well, okay, we'll take that into consideration, but of course we can't reveal this information. Then the next day I get a call from the same person. He said, we're gonna be sending two NASA people to uh, your building to practice photographing a jet flyover that we've arranged. And it happened to be the same day that Neil Armstrong died, but, uh, but uh, these two, a T-38 and another plane came over and uh, practiced the route that they were going to take with the 747. And, uh, and then the same photographers, we, we helped work with the Rangers to get them positioned to take, you know, pictures like this. This may even be theirs, so I'm not sure. But, mm -hmm. um, but they were throughout the park in different places getting pictures and in the air sh shooting the observatory from next to the 747. So, yeah, I mean, it, was, it was an incredible day and yeah. I did not know your connection to that, but that's just fascinating. Although I think I see myself on the roof there over on the right hand side. That's right. Well, we had radios and I remember from a hilltop I was on, I was sort of on the other side of the park, but I asked if you could have the guides open the domes, I remember. Um, yeah, you wanted them rotated and opened and we did. Yeah, I decided it was a better the... picture than having it. <laughs> yeah, it looks yeah. it looks really nice indeed. Yeah, to, Tony and I were up on that hill. Yeah. Looking at, at down at the observatory. Yeah. Yeah. I, my favorite comment was actually from one of our all space considered uh, regular members who looked at everything going on. And he says, you know, I think when the Gemini program den ended, there was nothing like this going on. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. So moving along, we take a look here. Voyager 1 enters inter interstellar space, but which time was that is the ongoing joke, of course. There's different hours. We flew by Pluto. We finally got a view of it. And then, of course, the <laughs> Apollo Golden Moon celebration, where you contributed so much. So many of your models were on display. So much of what we showed was there. You know, when did you first get interested in model making? Was it a driving force in your interest in spacecraft? Well, you know, it helped. You, I mean, I've always, I'm not a great model maker. I mean, I know that, well, but, it, but, I, but I've always used them because they're educational to me. Like, right. uh, you know, I, well, I don't know. You're pretty fantastic. Did you start back in the day, back in the sixties even? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, that's right. I remember that model cover now. <laughs> exactly. When, when yeah. you were on the cover, when you had a, a beard, but, but no, in all, in all seriousness though, um, <laughs> Tony's models, were a key component to our Apollo celebration, our Apollo 11 celebration. We had them on display in the depths of space. Um, the public very much enjoyed all your hard work and your efforts, and they were beautiful in those cases, and they were lit, and, and especially the large, you know, Apollo, the, the Saturn V model was really spectacular to that's see. That's right. Well, that, that one actually belongs to the observatory. That, that's, uh, that was, we got for that celebration, and actually, as I've been going in to clean out stuff, I've been adding a few decals that I left off at earlier. So 
um, but so that one will be around for other celebrations. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you for, for putting that together for us and having it be there. So <laughs> moving along a little bit here, take a look. Um, of course, All Space Considered Remote debuted. And finally, we return to space with uh, American Hardware to Space. Um, so you got to see that. And, you know, we're going to miss you, Tony. We really were your contributions to Griffith Observatory Space and Science. You're not done contributing, I know. You will probably become one of our many volunteers. We hope to see you on our star parties and further along. But we did more. Um, we like to think about what we've done. And if you could click it one more time here, and we'll see. Of course, there you are at our, um, I think it was one of our transits. You were looking at it out on the front lawn, of course, helping people observe on the roof. And of course, with our own curator, Laura Danley, we streamed so many events from our dome. You know, we blazed new trails with that. And I don't know, do we have someone out there? Alora, are you around, by the way? Matthew 2, labeled as Matthew 2, just so Tony <laughs> wouldn't notice. That's right. Surprise. Hi, Tony. Hi, of course I would be here, but of course I did try to mask it so I'd even keep a teeny bit of a surprise just to say congratulations, Tony, and I'm um, so happy for you. And as I tweeted at you earlier, welcome to retirement. Uh, the water's fine. I think you're going to love it. And I'm so, so happy for you. I, I did want to say a couple of words. And the David, you're just mentioning all these events. Um, you know, Tony, actually all of you guys, but with Tony in charge of the telescopes, uh, was up for anything, anything. You know, I think our first uh, stream was the Venus uh, um, transit. And we didn't know what we were doing. We were kind of, uh, I mean, I don't want to make it sound completely like, well, we were making it up as we went along, but we were kind of making, <laughs> we, we, we believed it would work, but you know, you never know. And uh, so that was just the start. And we had so many wonderful um, events and astronomical uh, celebrations. And I'll never forget the fly by Pluto because uh, Pluto, came above the horizon at 9.45 and, and typically events are supposed to end at 10. So we had to get Pluto and we had to get it now because we really wanted people to see Pluto through a telescope right around the same time on the same day that, that the New Horizons spacecraft um, passed Pluto. And so that was just a Herculean effort and um, it was a wonderful evening. And, um, you know, so I feel so Happy to have been able to celebrate all those astronomical events with you, Tony, and um, get a chance now just to say thank you. I also just want to mention one thing that he knows, because I said it to you a hundred times in the first 10 years. <laughs> but when I first got to Griffith Observatory, which was upon opening- I'm cleaning day, my office. I'm cleaning it, honest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Can you actually see the floor? Okay, no, for the people I don't watching, the jobs. don't want to go in there, especially now. <laughs> you have never seen, I have never known, and I've known a lot of scientists who have very messy offices. Tony Cook is really the winner of, of this offices. <laughs> but um, when I first got there, in, uh, which was our opening week, uh, uh, and Tom LaBonge was there, and I just wanted to say my heartfelt. Um, sympathies to his family and and so sad to lose Tom. I loved Tom. But anyway, uh, that opening, um, we had to figure out everything. I mean, there were just as a whole new organizational structure, all the staffs were different, all the division of labor was all different. And, uh, and Tony and his telescope team uh, was the one thing I didn't have to worry about really ever. He ran that group uh, with expertise and his staff uh, loved him and his great affection and trust and, and uh, respect for Tony. And that's saying a lot because everybody knows amateur astronomers and astronomers in general, you know, we're a very opinionated group and Tony kept that group really just humming along and providing uh, wonderful experiences of looking through telescopes every night on the lawn of Griffith Observatory um, and just uh, you know, so few worries in that regard. There were so many other things. The theaters had so many issues and, and the guide staff was sort of under new management. And before you were there, David, there was Elisa Lamb, but Tony was just a rock. And I will always be grateful um, that I just never had to think a bit because you had it always under control 
and a wonderful staff and you were a wonderful manager. And I, I know your staff feels the same way about that. And then lastly, I just want to say um, how much I love uh, sharing music with you. I know we've talked about that in this venue before, but um, Tony is a lover of classical music as am I, and I have learned so much from Tony and uh, been exposed to so much new music. You might not realize, well, Tony is completely proficient in, uh, you know, centuries worth of music literature, but it, it has a tremendous amount of knowledge in 20th century music. Um, and uh, I never saw Tony having lunch in the break room that he wasn't with a book, a uh, lifelong learning lover. And, um, and I know, Tony, that um, your newfound freedom is going to give you the opportunity to pursue all of those passions even more. And um, so I'm grateful to all of you for giving me just a few minutes to say thank you to Tony um, and to congratulate you and um, pass along my deep affection to all of you. I miss you all. Well, thank you, Laura, thank you so much for joining. And Tony, what, I'll let you answer her, but our pleasure well, to have you here. No, well, thank you, of course. And uh, I have to say a lot of things, you know, there's always times when bosses and employees have their things. But I have to say I learned a lot, especially in organizing with the staff. Uh, you know, I think it really helped the telescope demonstrators, the, the teamwork that you, I think, probably, you know, brought with you from NASA, which was kind of different than how we had been running things before. And you, you made it work so well that I think that, that you know, that that'll be how it is from now on and uh yeah. so well, thank well you. tony you made an impact too and we did uh -oh. make a little video here that we're going to roll and we're going to take a look at it here together and then we'll all have a few more remembrances and things to say after we take a look at the video as well so How many people saw our April eclipse on the internet? Oh yeah, did anybody see it online? I see a couple people, yeah. But our total count was like... Oh, 20. about 20 million. Yeah. We had about 20 million people watching that our feed, so... So, so let's Don't not screw up. up, I know, exactly. Um. <laughs> Maybe I'll focus it this time. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah there's a meteor shower, and that's the, the uh, Lyrid meteor shower. You mean the Lyrids? Lyrids. Are you calling me a liar? <laughs> and then the scene got a little bit better, but you really could barely make out any of the shadows. In contrast, this is what Hubble saw. So, yeah, they should put telescopes in space. I yeah, that would be a good idea. <laughs> the biggest event this month is summer, which will start on the 21st at 3.51 in the morning, so be sure to set your 1930s alarm clocks. <laughs> Throughout the date of the 10th, it's not going to change its distance very much center to center but how about here in los angeles the true center of the universe you know nasa created this view of what it would be like here however uh you can't come here at 405 in the morning the park doesn't open till five so please don't don't try to come up here because you won't be able to see it very well you won't be able to get here to see it also the milky way is so beautiful from here at that time <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. okay now as you might remember uh, yeah what does it mean it actually is meaningless but uh, I mean, there's a little tweet and you can tweet and uh, we also have a bunch of vids now on YouTube so we are just um, the hippest and uh, and we hope that you'll follow us tweet us, no follow us but I don't know what you friends no, you don't. Friend. I don't know what you do. You do things. You watch us, and it's great. Wait till she finds out about MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> Our opening story is about the Rosetta spacecraft, which is actually a European spacecraft, going to a comet called Comet P67. Churyumov Garishmenko. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Oh, oh something like on. that. I thought you had it. All right. I think I do. See that alien face right there? Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of neat faces. I think this is a, made by a society of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> here we go. How many of you have seen a Viewmaster? Okay, so quite a few. Back in the early 60s, that was the VR 
of its time. You know, it was a 3D yeah. <laughs> slide thing. That's true. And uh, one of the things that came out with was Man on the Moon. This was came out in 1964. It was a study of what we pictured the Apollo program would be. All right, first of all, it would involve building a gigantic rocket. It would involve two spacecraft. One would land on the moon, the other would return the astronauts to the Earth. It would involve somebody stepping on the moon and probably planting the American flag there. It would, might even involve finding glowing jewels and even <laughs> water on the moon. It would involve taking off from the moon. Uh, it might involve a spacewalk. Uh, it would involve coming back to the Earth at more than 25,000 miles per hour and surviving through the atmosphere. It would involve landing in the ocean and getting rescued. And finally, it would involve meeting the president and giving him glowing jewels and water from the moon. So, so, so but anyway, my point in this is actually not to mock the, uh, the, the Viewmaster slide set. Instead, it's actually to show that we actually, very early on, had a pretty clear picture of what was needed to get to the moon and what we, our plan was to do it. I've actually thought about your role a great deal because I saw the first Saturn V launch with Walter Cronkite and he got up and, oh my God, oh my God, and held in the window and, and stuff. And he yeah, had, yeah. Yeah, the rocket was cool, but his reaction told you what was really happening. And I had that same experience with the Starhopper first launch. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Oh my God, it's actually flying. What is going to be our next story? <laughs> ah, Falcon Heavy. Just to bring you up to date on what Falcon Heavy is, uh, SpaceX started with the Falcon rocket and decided there was really not much market for a kind of a tiny booster like that. So they went to the Falcon 9, which is like nine of these put together into one booster and began launching satellites and supply missions to the International Space Station. Then they developed the Falcon 9 so the first stage could land itself. And then they improved the engines with the idea that people might be riding this thing soon. That led to the current version, which is the Block 5 Falcon 9. And then if you put three of these together and do a little bit more fancy engineering, you end up with the Falcon Heavy, which is currently our largest booster. I mean, the heaviest lift booster that exists right now. But uh, other real important things are happening. Not again. Yes. <laughs> Another supermoon. The people who observe comets carefully, even in the amateur world, are rather small in numbers. And uh, I covered comets a lot for our Griffith Observer magazine. And I remember you, your colleague, Quan Ji, when he was in high school, because he had a blog in Shanghai of his comet observations. And he was one of the few places on the internet where you could find comet information from amateurs. And also I remember you because I also covered the hunt for Halley's Comet starting in 1980. And you were on the team at Palomar that made the first image of Halley's Comet in 1982. Back when, say, rag times were popular. What's it exciting here is if you look very carefully, you can see a little bit of detail on EO. And, uh, <laughs> And I remember back in 1979, when I was working here, that back then too, uh, Voyager got was getting pictures like this as it was approaching Jupiter, and it was kind of the first time we saw that uh, really int intricate cloud detail and markings on the moons distinctly. So, and here you can see Chang'e 4 and U22, the rover. So, so how do we know that's not staged? <laughs> That's true. NASA could be helping the Chinese fake a moon That's program. That's true. Thank you, Tony, and a big thank you to Hannah that put that video together, obviously, and our imagination that you'll be on that uh, roller coaster up in the stars in retirement, so um, in the front car, of course, leading the way. So, Tony, this has been your life at Griffith Observatory, of course, and, and Wait, you're with us. Didn't you hear that was rescinded? I, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, <laughs> oh well, wonderful. I can put you right to work on our, our new 
online school program we've been working on. I can uh, get, get you working on that again. No, but honestly, Tony, it has been a pleasure working with you at Griffith Observatory. You know, I've been here whatever, 12 and a half years. And, you know, you always were quick with a joke, but also ready with information. You know, I needed to know something in the sky. You were right there with it. You, you knew where to find it, where to get it. Um, what time is the solstice actually happening? Oh, you'd know that. Um, you know, when is the full moon? It, just the sky was yours. It was at your fingertip. And to lose that information, I can find it on the internet, sure. But it was always more fun to come talk to you about it because you had that extra layer. You know something else about it. You don't just know the, the details that are up front. You know that extra story. You have that interesting tidbit. And we're losing that at Griffith Observatory from, you know, by you retiring. But at the same time, I know how to reach you. So don't be surprised when I'm going to be tweeting at you saying, hey, Tony, tell me more about this. Because, uh, you know, you've been a foundation for us throughout there. And All Space Considered, we all saw the contributions there. Your quickness with the one-line quips, um, keeping people, you know, keeping people interested in the stories on the, the human level of it. Your your love of rockets and your, your real desire to see America get back to space and be doing it the right way, it's kind of contagious. You know, when you see something exciting happen, you'd come out of your office and talk about what was going on and your hope and your dreams of it becoming real. And seeing us make so much progress over the last 12 years, it was a pleasure to watch it happen with you right there with us um, from SpaceX to NASA to, you know, all, all the rover missions. It's just been fun. So thank you for all you've done, Tony. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, almost speechless. <laughs> but I have to know from Laura, how's the golfing shuffleboard and cruises? The shuffleboard. Oh, that would be so sad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have not played a, even one game of shuffleboard, but I, I, I did get an Oculus Quest and I have been playing a couple games on that. But um, no, I mean, you know what? I'm busier than ever. And I know that you will be too. I, I, I truly don't know where the day goes and how I also had a job. <laughs> how is that possible? So I think that you're going to find exactly the same thing. And, uh, and, I, and I can't wait to hear more. And I know we'll stay in touch. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and likewise, and back at you with everything. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with you all this time. So we are going to close out the show here as we're getting to the two hour mark. We honestly thought tonight was going to be an hour and a half show and we were under 200 slides even, but you know us at All Space Considered, we can we can bring it and we did here in honor of Tony and Apollo 14 and all the rest. But don't forget next month, we are going to bring you the Golden Griffies. They are coming back and we have a little promo here for you. Um, before I run the promo one more time, I'm going to pitch you to go become a member of Photo. We don't normally do this on this show, but it really has been a rough year for everybody. Griffith Observatory being closed for a year. Folks haven't been up there to see what we do, get excited about it, and join our member organization. We also need to make improvements. We're doing things like our new online school program. We're doing all sorts of things, and Friends of the Observatory is there for us. So click that link down below. Go ahead and join if you like this. You'll get to get an invitation to the next, um, the Perseverance one. My cat's up above meowing. He wants to become a member. Um, so do join. Think about it today. If you made it all the way to here in the program, I think you'll be happy that you did join. So from all of us here at All Space Considered, we'll see you next month on March 5th for our Golden Griffey Awards. We'll tell you whether Perseverance landed or not and how that went. And uh, Chris Patrick and I will be back and um, we'll bring you news of Laura and Tony as we receive it, of course. And um, we'll see you next month. So enjoy this little promo for next month's show and we'll see you then.
Good night, everybody from All Space Considered. We'll see you next month.